Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my greatest honor and privilege to be here with all of you for this event. Thank you so much for joining those here in person and watching the live stream. My name is Gonzalo Muñoz, high-level champion for COP25 and chair of the non state actor pillar of the COP28 Presidency's Food Systems and Agriculture Agenda on behalf of Her Excellency Rasan al-Mubarak, high-level champion for COP28. But first and foremost, I am a farmer from Chile, and I will be the moderator of this session with all of my pride. So to set the scene, it is clear that our current food systems are not fit for purpose, and they are in a major crisis. As you saw in the video, they account for a third of global emissions. They are the biggest driver of deforestation and biodiversity loss and use 70% of fresh water. And despite producing an excess of calories, over 700 million people face hunger and more than 3 billion people still cannot afford a healthy diet. Scandalously, many of those who cannot afford a healthy, sustainable food actually work in food production. So to put it simply, in order to achieve the Paris Agreement, meet our nature goals, or provide healthy, sustainable, affordable food for all, we have to act on food now. We need to transform our food systems to deliver for people, nature, and climate. Crucially, we need to change not just how we grow food, but also the kinds of food we produce and consume. This COP, COP28, under the leadership of the Emirates, has put food systems firmly on the table. This is an unprecedented achievement as never before. We have been waiting for this for at least 27 years. So I think that reserves a big round of applause. Thank you so much, not only to the COP28 presidency, but for all of you, and many of you not being here in person for the amazing work because it's rallying an effort that has been moving for decades. On December the 1st, at the World Climate Action Summit, the COP28 presidency announced that 134 world leaders had signed the Emirates Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems, and Climate Action, a landmark declaration on agriculture, food, and climate action. And we heard earlier today, this number is now at 152 member state, which is absolutely amazing. I would, have, I would bet any of you would have imagined that like a year ago. It's incredible. But at the same time, Her Excellency Riyansar Mubarak, the high-level champion for COP28, announced the launch of the non-state actors' shared call to action on transforming food systems for people, nature, and climate. We'll hear more about this in our event today, and many of the speakers have been involved in developing this call to action. Never before have seen such a strong commitment to action to transform food systems from governments, farmers, indigenous people, and other frontline food system actors, civil society, cities, businesses, philanthropy, research institutes, and many, many more. The non-state access call to action complements perfectly the Emirates Declaration and calls for its ambitious implementation. We have this incredible de declaration we now need all actors to take action, because together we can be bolder, move faster, and unlock the potential of food systems as one of the main solutions for people, nature, and climate. It is now my real great honor to invite to the stage Her Excellency Rasan al-Mubarak, UN Climate Change High-Level Champion for COP28, to provide the keynote address. Her Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Thank you so much for your leadership. We're all here, ladies and gentlemen, because we recognize that food is a lifeline, connecting us to our heritage, our communities, and our environment. It's a vital economic pillar for billions of people worldwide. And the agricultural systems that produce our food also help shape our landscapes and the environment we call home. But our current food systems is a paradox. It fuels life, but drains vital natural resources. 
and often, as we've seen in the video, often fails to provide sustainable, healthy, and affordable food for all. Significantly, food systems contribute to a third of our global emissions and are major contributors to biodiversity loss. And that is why we need to tackle our food systems on two fronts. First, we need to decarbonize our food systems at every level. And second, we need to eliminate the negative impact of our food systems on nature. The encouraging part, we know how to transform our food systems for the benefit of people, nature, and climate. The COP28 UAE Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems, and Climate Action was signed by 134 world leaders. $2.5 billion has been mobilized to support food security whilst combating climate change. And this agenda has been pushed forward thanks to convenings like the UN Food Systems Summits. However, as we all know, a gap still remains in translating this ambition into action. And this is why we've launched the non-state actors' shared call to action to transform food systems for people, for nature, and for climate. This initiative, ladies and gentlemen, aims to accelerate change by 2030, making our food systems beneficial beneficial for people, nature, and climate. And I'm proud to say that over 200 entities have already joined. The call to action is guided by four key principles. Firstly, it calls for time-bound holistic global targets by COP29. Second, it calls on governments to provide supportive policy and financial incentives to accelerate this transition. Thirdly and critically, it centers the, roles of, the role of farmers, indigenous peoples, and other frontline food system actors, calling for more direct access to finance and resources whilst respecting the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. Finally, it emphasizes the need for partnership and collaboration to achieve the change that we need to see. I'm proud to shortly share the stage with incredible food system leaders whose insights we will collectively hear today. And in fact, I invite all of you to join this call to action, because I know that it's only together that we can reshape the food systems to benefit people and planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Your Excellency, thanks so much. It's my honor to work with you and keep working with you. Uh, and we're really grateful uh, for your championing this hugely important issue. It's now my great pleasure to invite onto stage two incredible leaders. Elizabeth Nimadala, president of the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation, an agripreneur and family farmer from Uganda, and Africa board member of the World Farmers Organization. Please, Elizabeth, join me on stage. and Juan Carlos Gintiach, a member of the Shuar people of the Ecuadorian Amazon and executive secretary of the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. To all, both of them provide some remarks from the perspective. Juan Carlos, thank you for joining. If we can have a seat. They will be joined by other frontline food system actors, the farmers, fishers, pastoralists, indigenous peoples, women and youth who have such a vital role to play in producing food and stewarding natural resources. Please join us on stage. Thank you. No, there. So I will start with you, Elizabeth. Uh, food is finally on the table at the Climate Cop, and at least from what I've seen, farmers and other 
frontline food systems actors are more visible and vocal than ever before. Could you please share with us the key messages and ask of farmers at this moment in time and why it is significant that farmers organizations have joined this shared call to action? You can take it from here or from the podium, wherever you prefer. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, thank you, colleagues, distinguished excellencies, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first of all uh, congratulate um, you, Gonzalo, and our UN High Level Champion for the excellent leadership and the team that has been behind putting together the non-state actors call to action, which is very ambitious and very much in line with the MLET's declaration on sustainable agriculture, resilient food systems, and climate action. And I'm happy that uh, food is at the center of discussions in this COP. MLET has really provided a platform for discussing food. But colleagues, we cannot keep doing things in the same way and expect to have different answers. For now, 28 years of COP, there is little in terms of impact that we can show out of the decisions and the resources that have been allocated to mitigation and adaptation. In fact, the situation is dire. Agriculture has only been discussed for the last five years. And it's only last year in Shalmashek that we managed to have agriculture as a program. So what does this mean? That either it is facing um, head, headwind and in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the instruments that we are putting together and the pathways to be able to deliver. But also, it means that the interventions that we need to scale are really, uh, are really not been, uh, you know, uh, considered and taken on by the different uh, actors. So that is why I'm proposing the following. And these are proposals on behalf of the farmers' constituency globally. All the funding interventions need to put farmers at the center. We need to have affirmative action. We need to see at least 30% of the farmers having direct access to financing. That is when you can gladly say that you're putting farmers at the center. And by doing this, we shall be able to have this as an indicator in the global goal for adaptation. We also need to expand the accredited entities that are receiving climate financing. We need to have more institutions that are leaning to agriculture. Institutions like agriculture banks and development banks in our different countries. But we also need to put together a, um, a technical assistance facility that is going to build the capacity of these institutions. We also need to create either another accreditation mechanism that is going to have more institutions, more of these institutions as accredited entities. And that is when we will be able to have direct access of funding by the smallholder farmers. The way it is now, the ground is not leveled and farmers are not having access to financing. Ladies and gentlemen, agriculture is an integral part of climate action. We cannot afford to lump smallholder farmers with all the other actors. We are the key actors, we are the solutions to transforming our food systems. We need to have direct access to financing. I thank you. Elizabeth, thanks so much for these incredibly inspiring words. Uh, Juan Carlos, I would now go to you. Mucho gusto. Uh, indigenous peoples and local communities have a deep connection to the land that has nurtured their traditional knowledge. 
They produce food in a unique way that keeps seed and species diverse, diversity sorry, and protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. What can the food and agriculture community do to support indigenous peoples and local communities to ensure you can continue to be the guardians of the world's diversity and land? Please, Juan Carlos, if you can take the podium. Muchas gracias. Quiero saludar a nuestra hermana, Madame Razan Bravac, campeona del High Level. Me gusta saludarla. A mi hermano, Gonzalo Muñoz, también un campeón High Level. Yo creo que un aplauso para ustedes primeros y para todos mis hermanos y hermanas aquí. Hoy me encuentro ante ustedes con un profundo honor como vocero y representante de la Alianza Global de Comunidades Territoriales de 24 países de los bosques tropicales, que manejamos y protegemos 958 mil millones de hectáreas que confiere esta importante responsabilidad para explicar toda nuestra acción relacionada con la alimentación, la agricultura, nuestros bosques, sabiduría y lo que nosotros somos, los verdaderos dueños y guardianes de la naturaleza. Los pueblos indígenas desempeñamos un papel crucial en la preservación mineraria de la genética y de las semillas a nivel mundial. Nuestra ancestral forma de sembrar y cuidar la tierra nos ha permitido mantener vivas nuestras especies que hoy disfrutamos en las mesas de todo el mundo durante toda nuestra alimentación. Sin nuestro compromiso en la preservación y la diversidad de las semillas, no tendríamos una amplia variedad de productos como guayusa, cacao, plátanos, maíz, azaí, guaraná y otros más. El color y el significado y el sabor que dan la vida a nuestra alimentación proviene de las semillas y tierras que defendemos y cuidamos con determinación. Personalmente, creo mi persona y todos mis hermanos con esa diversidad de cultura y saberes y en mi comunidad propia, viva todos los días, mantenemos una relación de trabajo y armonía con la naturaleza, una comunicación espiritual profunda. Brindamos estos modos de vida y de sostenibles con los alimentos que nutren y curan y conectan. Nuestros pueblos, la semilla va más allá del mero medio para generar ingresos a través de la siembra de monocultivos. Es una promesa de hoy, mañana y el presente. Nuestra conexión íntima con la tierra nos capacita para adaptar las semillas del cambio climático de manera más efectiva que cualquier otro momento en la comunidad. Comprendemos, nosotros sabemos cuándo y cómo nuestras semillas están enfermas y sabemos utilizar nuestros fertilizantes naturales de nuestros ecosistemas, biodiversidad y bosques. Guiados por nuestra conexión con la Pachamama, con la Madre Tierra, creamos resiliencia para resistir las sequías, inundaciones y, y vientos. Unimos este llamado a la acción. Instamos a todos los actores, tanto y dentro fuera del gobierno, a respetar, a valorar profundamente la relación que tenemos con nuestras chacras. Cuando yo hablo de las chacras, cuando yo hablo de las ajas, no me refiero simplemente a cosechar alimento. Estamos hablando de nuestra ciencia indígena milenaria. Es por eso que nos conecta cómo cosechar esos lazos, cómo trabajar esa conexión cultural y espiritual con nuestro saber milenario. Trabajar en las chacras, no solo esperar que la tierra nos provea alimentos, sino nosotros proveer a la tierra, cuidar el agua, los nutrientes y tiempo de descanso, que es esencial el respeto 
hacia la naturaleza, porque somos nosotros la naturaleza. Lo que esperamos de este llamado a la acción es que los sistemas elementarios respeten y aprendan de nuestros modelos de conocimientos tradicionales. Sin embargo, para lograrlo, los pasos fundamentales son claros. El reconocimiento de nuestra propiedad intelectual y nuestro respeto a esos saberes. Confíen en nosotros los pueblos indígenas, todos ellos y ellas. Trabajaremos en colectividad, trabajamos en minga, trabajamos en solidaridad, afros, todos juntos en colectividad, sin dejar a nadie atrás. Es por ello que se invierten en nosotros, en nuestras propuestas y conocimientos, devolveremos al mundo la variedad de las semillas, sabores, colores, conexiones con la Madre Tierra que alimentan nuestro cuerpo y nuestro espíritu. You mean Samuel Makiti, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Juan Carlos, por esas palabras, por poner en claro que somos naturaleza eh, y por proponer que trabajemos con respeto a los saberes ancestrales, pero sobre todo también por esa solicitud de confianza. Creo que esa palabra es una, una palabra que está fragilizada en nuestro contexto de alimentación y nos vendría de maravilla el recuperarla tomando en consideración las propuestas de solidaridad que vienen de los pueblos indígenas. So thank you so much, Elizabeth and Juan Carlos, for your powerful and moving words. A huge round of uh, applause for our, to our incredible speakers and for all the farmers, indigenous peoples, and other frontline food system actors for the role they play. A, I urge us all to hold these words both in your heads and your hearts as we work together on this shared agenda. Thank you so much. Can we go back? Yes. Okay, not later. We will have a family photo later. Yes. Thank you. So it's my real pleasure to now invite our new and our, our next speaker to the stage. So Sarah Farley, Vice President of the Global Food Portfolio at the Rockefeller Foundation. Sarah, please join me on stage. We can have a five-side conversation, <laughs> right? Much better. It's so good. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, Sara, uh, we've just heard extremely powerful statements from farmers and indigenous people, even directly recognizing the importance of finance in general, and philanthropy plays a relevant role there. We need to mobilize capital for not only what Juan Carlos mentions on uh, working towards and with the, anxious, uh, the, the ancestors, and the, uh, or, or the indigenous uh, knowledge, but also, as Elizabeth well referred to, we need to mobilize direct finance to, for farmers all around the world. Uh, and you have been working with a group of philanthropies and contributing to, a, to this shared agenda on food system transformation. What can you tell us about that? Thank you, Gonzalo. And I feel so inspired and grounded hearing the voices directly from the indigenous people and the farmers. So often in these spaces, we talk about the numbers and the statistics, and they are living them. Uh, so as, as a member of philanthropy, we see it so clearly. We urgently need to transform not only how we produce our food, how we distribute it, process it, package it, even how we eat it. This is a massive challenge. And, and indeed, it feels really daunting. Um, as 24 philanthropies led by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, we just did a calculation to quantify how much it would actually cost to transition from our chemically dependent industrial mode of food production to a regenerative agroecological approach to production. And the cost is massive. It's at least 250 to 430 billion dollars a year for 10 years. And while that sounds extraordinary, it is quite small compared to the cost of inaction, which is 10 to 12 trillion dollars. These are costs we're paying 
We're just not accounting for them. Their cost to the environment, biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions, our health, and even the spiritual connection and the loss of that as described so beautifully by Juan Carlos. The good news is that we know what needs to be done. In fact, we even know how to do it. We need to shift this mode of production to build back biodiversity, sequester carbon, and, and build the quality of our connection to the land. This can be done. And, and it's not even new. You know, I think part of what philanthropy is recognizing is whether we call it regenerative or agroecological approaches, indigenous food ways, it goes by so many names, but there is a long track record. There's so much knowledge and there is willingness. And so I think what is so exciting about philanthropy's role here is that now we're met by 150 countries that have signed 152. the Emirates. 152 <laughs> countries that have signed the Emirates Declaration. We're joined by corporates, by civil society, farmers, indigenous communities stepping forward, calling for even higher ambition through the non-state actors coalition. And as philanthropy, we're looking at ourselves. We're demanding that we step forward with at least 10x increase in contributions to this transformation. We're calling for that from private investment. We're calling for that from public investment. So these are all really critical steps that we've seen occurring here at this COP. But you know, fundamentally, I think all of us have to ask ourselves right here, right now, if we're waiting for someone else at a different point in time with a different set of political constraints to take the hardest steps, or if we will bend the curve of biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas emissions, and the curve of justice, or pass these challenges on to our children. And, and I think as philanthropy, as non-state actors, we stand to take this moment for what it is. Thank you so much. And I, and I believe, Sarah, that when it comes to those billions, it's, it's even a fraction of the 600 plus, 60, 600 plus billions that are now under uh, subsidies that are affecting our food system as well, right? So it's, That's right. Yeah. It, it, would get us, it would get us the cost, the 430 billion, if right now today in this space, we could transition just that portion of subsidies pushing against this transition would cover the cost immediately. Brilliant. Yeah. So thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you, Gonzalo. So thanks so much, Sarah, for sharing this with us. We encourage philanthropists to join the effort. We will now transition into our panel discussion and watch a short video as we're setting up. Today, we recognize the power of the people in our agriculture and food systems as a force for collective positive change. Today, we affirm that agriculture and food systems must transform to enable food security and nutrition for all and to achieve goals for climate and nature. commit to work with farmers and all food systems actors to combat the impacts of climate change. We recommit ourselves to ensuring food security and nutrition for all, leaving no one behind. We place water and nature at the heart of our food and climate agendas. Today, we accelerate the transformation of our agriculture and food systems. Our actions are local, but our impact must be global. Today, we unite. Together, we lead the way towards a sustainable, resilient, and prosperous future for all. Great, so I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for a panel discussion on bold collaboration in food system transformation. So I would be calling you, please take your seat here. First, Joel Campari, Global Leader of Food Practice at WWF. Welcome, Joel. Tudo de bom. 
Also, my dear friend Diane Holdorf, Executive Vice President at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Great to have you here, Diane. Next, this is Stuart McAlpine, a farmer from Western Australia and Chair of Regen WA. Thank you for being here, Stuart, and traveling for that long, far place like Chile. Also, Vivian Maduke, Program Coordinator, Climate and Health at the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. Great to have you here, Vivian. And last but not least, Stefanos Fotou, Director at the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. Great to have the five of you here. Hi, Stefanos. Brilliant. You're all mic'd, right? Yes. No, you're not. Here you have a microphone. Please use it. I will go with mine. So, great. Um, I will start with you, uh, Diane, uh, jumping right in. The call to action recognizes the need to address power imbalances and societal inequality and promote a just food system transition, right? We've heard from Elizabeth and from Juan Carlos why it is, it is so important, and we know that this is a very relevant topic. Why is it also important for businesses to really acknowledge and learn into this? Thanks, Gonzalo. You know, we, as you said, we heard really eloquently from both Elizabeth and Juan Carlos that they're business leaders. And they need to be part of the business transition that we're together collectively driving. WBCSD was really proud to partner with the presidency and the champions on the non-state declaration actors movement to endorse this. And farmers were at the center of that piece. We need to continue to make sure that we have full engagement and representation. And we've been very increasingly deliberate in ensuring that happens. Any company that you speak to who's in the food and land-based sector knows that without those who are stewarding the resources of the ground, their business is not viable. But we need to create those connections much more strongly. And Elizabeth spoke to the financial examples of that. One of the initiatives that we help to support into the unprecedented positioning of food into the climate stage was the action agenda for regenerative landscapes. And it brings together over 25 organizations at a starting point that are for working on 160 million hectares with 3.6 million farmers, mobilizing 2.2 billion in funding today committed. Now, companies were only able to come into that if they were willing and able to demonstrate how that worked at a landscape farm level and that they had farmer and farmer organization engagement already engaged in their plan and in their work and that one of the measures that they would commit to demonstrate performance against was farmer livelihoods. So we built in accountabilities to that to demonstrate how we drive that connectivity back. As that continues to be just one of many ways of accelerating connectivity, it should be able to funnel more finance, more action, greater outcomes. Much more work to do, but it's a core part of actions going forward. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks so much, Diane. Uh, Joao, the call to action speaks clearly about the need to address hunger and malnutrition, right? It's a, a change food uh, environment, so it needs to, to make it easier for consumers to access healthy, nutritious, sustainable, and locally appropriate diets. How can multi-stakeholder action and support such goals? Uh, thanks, Gonzalo. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration is key to achieving food and nutrition security, limiting climate change, reversing biodiversity loss, and protecting people who are most reliant on the sustainability of food systems for their, for their livelihoods. However, we need to remember that food environments are very context specific. So because of that, they respond to different levers. So it's very important that we bring all stakeholders, especially national and local stakeholders, to bear weight and raise their voices so that they are part of the transformation for the food systems they need and want. At WWF, uh, we do build alliances with multiple stakeholders all the time as we try to pull as many of these levers as possible. So food systems become nature positive, climate neutral, while enhancing the, the welfare of uh, local communities. Uh, but multi-stakeholder collaborations, by the way, can uh, need to move beyond intention. They need 
to lead to implementation on the ground, in the water, for people, climate, and nature. And for that to happen, multi-stake collaborations must deliver access to knowledge and increase the capacity of communities to act. Alliances also need to ensure the right incentives are present for local stakeholders to do what it takes to improve uh, the food systems that they rely on. A good example uh, of uh, a collaboration alliances is what we call the TERFs Consortium, where WWF alongside GAIN, EAT, CARE, ECAD, Club of Rome, and C40 are working together to implement food systems transformation in urban and peri-urban areas. And by bringing together our different institutional strengths, we can do, have a larger impact and good, do better for the collective good. And finally, uh, by amplifying the scope for action of different stakeholders, multi-stakeholder collaborations and alliances help address power imbalances and actively work to engage those communities and populations whose voices are generally not heard. So, but who must be present to develop solutions, especially solutions uh, that protect the rights of indigenous peoples, as we heard before, and local communities. Particularly, they are, I'd like to highlight the fact that they are the first and most important stewards of nature. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joel. So going back to you, Vivian, uh, the call to action is clear that all actors need to support frontline food systems actors to respond and adapt to climate shocks and stresses and promote more direct access to finance. We've heard also from Elizabeth, heard it from Juan Carlos, I think it was absolutely clear. We know we have a very big finance gap to fill. Uh, so what role can philanthropy play to bridge that gap? Thank you very much. As an alliance of philanthropic foundations, we firmly believe in the power and flexibility of philanthropic finance to take greater financial risks that might not be possible for public and private finance. And we do believe that with this flexibility, we're able to, as philanthropy, fund more progressive initiatives, like Sarah mentioned, like agroecology and regenerative practices, shifting away from unhealthy food environments, investments in reducing food loss and waste, and also directly funding farmers. We do believe it's our role as philanthropy to get dollars directly in the hands of farmers. At the moment, 0.3% of climate finance, only 0.3% gets to farmers. We do believe as philanthropy, we're able to directly fund farmers and frontline leaders. We're able to enable them to withstand some of the shocks and crisis, but also enable them to hold their governments and private sector accountable. I do believe that's the role of philanthropy. Um, I also want to flag that just like countries, philanthropy is very different and diverse. Priorities, interests are quite diverse. However, as a collective, what should drive our investment include the principles of equity, the principles of justice, the principles of inclusion. So our responsibility is very clear. The first one is to catalyze public and private finance towards more progressive action. Two, to get the dollars into the hands of um, frontline leaders, including farmers and fisher folk. And the third responsibility is to ensure that our investments do not skew the balance of power, rather it uses the principle of equity, justice and inclusion. Thanks okay. so much. Okay. Thanks so much, Vivian. Let me go to, to you, Stuart. Uh, the call to action highlights also the important role that governments play in creating the enabled conditions for food system transformation. How can the right set of policies and incentives address these challenges that farmers face today and accelerate action and ambition? Yeah, I think that's a, a great and difficult question, I think, because I think one of the problems is that there's such a large disassociation from government and, and what's happening on the farm. And I think, like, I'm very positive, like, the, the services and the things that farmers and indigenous management can do to solving some of the problems, but we'll go through some problems about it. So we need to make sure that we get out on country um, on the land and look at the, the, you know, the innovative farmers that are demonstrating, you know, working with nature very effectively and capture that and make sure that, that, that when we're looking at um, providing those incentives that we're re rewarding nature-based solutions that are good for the environment, you know, still provide good economical solutions and good for society. And 
So we want to really um, reward outcomes. And I think I still see a bit coming in policy about re rewarding practice. Practice are the tools that we use, but we should actually encourage innovation by allowing people and custodians of the land to use whatever technology they can to achieve the outcomes that we want as a society. So I think that's really important. And lastly, I think we are going to need some assistance um, to um, get farmers through some of the tough challenges that they're going to have from climate and things like wars and the effect that they have on the economics because we're going to see some really large extremes. And to put that in my context, um, you know, this year I've had the worst production year that we have ever had in my life as a farmer, and yet the year before we had our best. And then if I look at the climate data for my farm, I've lost 30% of, of uh, yield potential based on a decrease in precipitation in our growing season and also uh, two degrees extra heat units and the effect on evapotranspiration. So it's quite massive. That's a 30%, 31% drop in my productivity. So how do we encourage young people? I'm a 60-year-old average farmer from Australia and I think those numbers seem to be quite constant across a lot of countries. So we need to create um, you know, incentives and, and robustness in our business models as well in our supply models to ensure that we can encourage um, you know, new people into farming. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Stuart. So, Stefanos, the UN Food System Summits are now the, uh, are, are now the Emirates Declaration have really helped to build momentum and drive commitments from national governments. We are all celebrating it, so thank you for the work that UN Food System Summit had, has done and, and the platform that has given to all of this to happen. What role can multi-stakeholder partnership play uh, in supercharging those efforts? No, it's off. I use this is on. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Gonzalo. So um, I would say three points. One is all of these multi-stakeholder partnerships should be partnerships for action. And you have the call for action that you have adopted here. There is the call for action from the Secretary General on the stock taking moment, and we see how we implement this. So action should be at the center of everything. The second, and I don't know if I can be political correct here, but I will say you, it. I mean, no one's listening I think we here. need all these multi-stakeholder partnerships, the constituencies to challenge each other. There is a tendency that the multi-stakeholder partnerships, they are just challenging the governments. They tell them what you have done. And I must say, I'm, I'm not here to, to defend the governments, but they have done things, okay? Uh, s small steps, baby steps, but there are things happening. But I want the multi-stakeholder partners, the partner of each partnership to challenge the, one, the other one. I do want the civil society to challenge the private sector and ask for more accountability for the private sector. Ask the private sector if it's applying the polluters pain principle. I want at the same time the private sector to ask the foundations if they are actually implementing an agenda that it's according to the 2030 agenda or if they're implementing their agenda. I want the foundations to ask the civil society if they are representing their constituencies or individual interests. So this cross Fertilization that we need to do on accountability is extremely important. The message here is that everyone has objectives, but in a partnership, you need to cross check how much the objective of one partner is fitting the objective of the other partner. And the third point, I think, for, for this multi stakeholder partnership is to identify how they can really support with solutions plans that they have already happened. And on this, I think it's very important, and the UN Hub would like to work um, a lot with these multi-stakeholder partnerships to understand how we can make change at the national level. We have the food system national teams, and these teams, they need local ecosystems of support from multi-stakeholder partnerships to make things happen. Thank Brilliant. you. Th thanks so much, Stefano. I think that what you mentioned in terms of the cross-accountability mechanism is very much alike to the ambition loop referred in the, in, in the Paris Agreement, how we see governments taking action and then immediately having non-state actors helping the implement such an agreement and increasing the ambition and 
as we've heard from many of you, all of you, and, and, and the other speakers, the importance of reaching a higher ambition and then see how that lands into local regulation. Uh, I'm going to go for another round of, of uh, questions, one minute each, so please be as brief as possible. So, Joao, the call to action calls for time-bound, aligned, holistic, global targets for food system by COP29 at the latest and actionable evidence-based locally appropriate food system transition pathways. Why is it important and what's needed to drive progress on this? Uh, thanks, Gonzalo. At COP29, at the latest, I at like the that. Latest. So, yeah. If so, you can uh, do it tomorrow, much be better. Awesome. It's, it's because, you know, the, the science is, is, is very clear, right, that we will not deliver on the Paris Agreement if we don't um, take immediate climate action on food systems. And by that, I mean production, consumption, and food loss and waste. So ambitious uh, global agreements now at COP28 are critical uh, to move us forward in that ground. Um, I do, though, regret the fact that last week negotiators have already wasted one opportunity to uh, take a big step forward on the Sharm El Sheikh joint work uh, by allowing it to stagnate. Uh, they can't pass another opportunity this week, uh, you know, to make our ambition, uh, you know, uh, to deliver on this ambition with urgency and listen to science. If they deliver, uh, it will send a very strong signal to all stakeholders to take ambition, uh, ambitious actions, uh, actions on food systems and to urgently translate global commitments into national and local action on the ground and in the water. So perhaps all of us here that have a relationship with the negotiators, let's um, ask them to read our non-state call to action once again, please, so that they can deliver on the Emirates Declaration and on our call to action. Listen to science with the urgency that it deserves. Thank you. Thanks so much. I couldn't agree more, Joao, absolutely. So please, everyone, search for any negotiator, mostly those that are working on the food uh, uh, environment, and, and ask for uh, the text of this COP to reflect on this incredible momentum that we're seeing in stakeholders and, of course, related to the Emirates Declaration. Uh, and in that sense, and related to science, you know, Diane, that this call to action um, is calling out the expectation for business and financial institutions to set targets, disclose, and report via third-party verified frameworks. What needs to be done to increase transparency account and accountability in this sector? Thanks, Gonzalo. Yeah, we absolutely support the action needed here, but you're right. I mean, the world is increasingly looking to business for the solutions. And of course, it's the innovation and the technology and the finance, but it is also the governance, the accountability, the transparency, and the disclosure makes visible how these elements are moving across supply chains and across economies. There are increasingly systems in place like the Science-Based Targets Initiative that ensure companies set science-based targets to aligned with 1.5. For any company in the agricultural value chain, the majority of that occurs within what science calls with that scope three at the farm. Action needs to be clear on how the data is appropriately gathered, appropriately shared, how farmers can be compensated and producers can be compensated for how that data is provisioned and how it can be exchanged across value chains through to how it is transparently reported using mechanisms like the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure and other regulatory or voluntary reporting frameworks. The types of initiatives should always require accountability, governance, and reporting as well. And I already referenced that in the Action Agenda for Regenerative Landscapes launched here. But we need to be consistent and coherent with that and drive companies across the value chains to support what can still be a complex set of actions to be able to leverage those and go full, full transparency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Vivian, uh, one of the priority actions in the call to action is aligning food systems with the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, what are the key actions needed to put us on track for that? 
I'll start by saying that at the moment, our industrialized food system is contributing 15% of global fossil fuel use. Therefore, for us to meet our 1.5 degree goal, we need to transition from our reliance on fossil fuels. And we can do that th through various ways. The first one is to transition from fossil fuel-based inputs towards agroecological and regenerative practices, to also look at promoting more plant-rich, culturally appropriate, nutritious, minimally processed foods. At the moment, our food system is driving towards ultra-processed foods, and that is a problem both for our people and also for planet. At the same time, shifting towards renewables for our processing, cooling, and heating operations. And also, quite importantly, is to track the consolidation of corporate power and consolidation of corporations. That in itself is also one of the reasons why our industrial food system is reliant on fossil fuels. So I think these are the actions that evidence show could work. So now beyond all our talk is to actually go into action because this is an urgent situation and we need to act now. Thank you. Thank you. So Stefanos, um, what do you see as next steps coming out of uh, COP28 for you as and how can we really build on this moment and, and drive food systems transformation so we can see countries updating their NDCs with ambitious action uh, on food and already taking action by COP30? Thanks, Gonzalo. So um, we look at the implementation of the Emirates Declaration as a very important point for the next two years. After the stock taking moment of the food system stock taking moment that we had in July, and knowing that the Emirates Declaration is also coming, we started thinking about an initiative that the UN Food System Coordination Hub is putting together. We call it the Convergence Initiative. And we do want to work with uh, countries, with stakeholders, with the ecosystem of support to try to align the planning, the implementation, the science-based approach for these two um, very much aligned agendas, the climate action agenda and the food system transformation agenda. So from, from the hub, we have put this initiative together. Uh, we have around, we had the first round of consultation with our main constituencies, which is the UN food system convenors, our national food system focal points. And we will initiate also now um, round tables of consultation with, with the stakeholders. And we would like you, uh, Gonzalo, in this, we want to see the champions network being part of this consultation we'll have, so we can get your ideas and understand how we can support uh, local action, action at the, at the country level, that they can make this convergence happen. Our milestone is 2025, 20, uh, where we have the COP30, and the second stock-taking moment. And I would really be humble if your network with the current champion and the next two champions of the, of the COPs could join us and, and support uh, the work we'll do at the country level. Thank you. If Rasan agrees, then I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stefanos. Stuart, uh, you were very concrete in your first answer while speaking about loss of around 30% of yields and productivity. It can feel quite overwhelming and I would say scary right, when you consider the impacts on climate, nature, and food security crisis, and the world we're living for future generations. It's, it's definitely something that moves us personally, and, and when it comes to connecting the food, the people, the global crisis, it's something that uh, we cannot pa just pass by. And I know that you're just about to become a grandfather. Congratulations for that. Uh, what do you hope? is the legacy you can leave from your land stewardship to future generations? Thank you. Um, a great question. And I guess for me, agriculture has been a, a journey and it's the experiences that you learn along the way and then you try and pass them on to other people. But for me, it's doing all the amazing things that happen on the farm and my discovery of sort of, you know, the microbiome and how important that is into you know, creating functioning soils. You know, it all starts in the soil. We get that right and we have healthy soil, we have healthy, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy ecosystems and, and healthy humans. You know, it just creates the right environment. But that's not all that's broken. You know, like 
the legacy, I think, is the work that I've been doing off-farm creating regenerative food companies because how do we get this wonderful food and um, maintain that value so that people are uh, eating that healthy food? You know, the finance system, the research system, we need to all work together. So to be part of that is also important because we can't pick, you know, it's like having an engine, you can't fix, you know, part of the engine if the rest of it's broken as well. So I think um, it's, it's sharing knowledge, taking knowledge on, um, and, being, and being a mentor and, and actually having a lot of faith that we, we can make this happen, you know, like I've seen it on my farm and I go, why is this so hard for people to get? You know, why is it so hard that we can work with nature and create so much amazing things? So it's about installing that passion. It's about coming out and sharing that story with other people from, from other places in the world and creating scale because it doesn't really matter what I do on my farm if we're not creating whole landscapes of change, whole countries of change, and we all together as one become earth stewards. We look after the planet and we repair it and we enjoy it. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Stuart, and thank to all of our panelists for sharing your invaluable insights and experiences. A, it's been a privilege to moderate this panel and thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. Let's keep it up. We must meet in COP29 with, with everything that Joan will bring us and, and with concrete NDCs and Haynes at COP30. So thank you so much. Big round of applause. So I am now incredibly excited, as we've just heard from a, a future grandfather. Now I want to introduce our final speakers, Aya Munir Yango, Contact Point for Food and Agriculture Working Group, UN Food Systems Summit Plus Two Youth Task Force, and Alexis Baliman, Switzerland Climate Youth Delegate, to provide some perspective from youth and on the importance of the role of youth in food and agriculture. They are accompanied by representative from Yango. Aya and Alexis, the floor is yours. Oh, putain, ils ont mis nos photos ensemble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. We stand in front of you today as Yongo, the youth and children constituency to the UNFCCC. We stand united to ensure that youth and children voice are at the center of the decision-making table. We stand united to act as a bridge between youth at the grassroots levels, working in food systems, and global decision-making processes. This means ensuring that local voices make it to the global spaces such as this one. We stand today united to ensure an inclusive and diverse representation of our members on our on-site policy advocacy work and to ensure that this historically exclusive space becomes more inclusive. Yeah. At the core of our work is the Global U Statement. The Global U Statement is a summary of the climate policy demand from all youth among 150 countries. And there are some demands about food and agriculture. We have one big goal and three key targets. A holistic food system transformation with access to affordable, sustainable, and healthy diets, support and compensation for food producer using agroecological practices, and support of people in vulnerable situation. Healthy, sustainable, and affordable diets are at the center of food system transformation. And we have been working with the presidency this year on the catering strategy of the food at COP to make it better. We, applaud, we are very happy to say that today at COP, two-thirds of the food distributed is plant-based, locally sourced, healthy, and nutritious. 
And this proved that by working together, we can achieve great things. And this was also the case of the UAE Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food System, and Climate Action. We applaud the work that was done to include youth. We were honored to be one of the major group to be first consulted in the draft and the suggestion of input. However, we are deeply concerned coming out of COP without any cover decision on SSGW and for now with a very weak language on GST. As youth, we believe that action should come first. This is why we were so enthusiastic to work together with the clim climate champion teams from the beginning to bring in the youth vision to the non-state actors' call to action for transforming food systems for people, nature and the climate. One of our key demands is to ensure equitable access to resources, finance and decent livelihoods, as well as actively seek out and include indigenous peoples, farmers, women and youth in decision making. And this aligns perfectly with our call to action. It is clear that our food systems are in crisis and they are take, being taken for granted. We want everyone to feel the urgency to take action now. This is the main reason why we endorse this call to action and you should join us all. This is not only a document to remain published, but it's a basis of implementation we should all adopt to target that one element that is linked to every and single SDG that contributes to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of water use, and 80% of biodiversity loss. Yes, it is our food systems. If all different stakeholders move from a call to action to real action, together, hand in hand, we can transform food systems for people, nature, and the climate. We must unite, act, and deliver. To act for, for food, food is, is to, to act, act for, for a change. change. So, uh, thank you so much, Aya, Alexis, and all of you as youth representatives who have joined us today. We, you are not only the future of, of the humanity, but you are also the future of the food system. So thank you. Keep the hard work. We count on you, and you should count on us as well. Uh, and I was, I'm always humble and all, uh, by you. Thank you for being here with us and, uh, and for sharing such a, a profound, deep, concrete statement. So thanks for that. Please stay in stage. Uh, this brings us, of course, to the end of our event. I just want to say huge thanks to all of our speakers and everyone who joined us on stage and those that were hearing the, and listening to, to the event online. We have a long way to go, we know that, but we have made huge progress. And, uh, and we need to build on this great work and continue to connect the food, nature and climate agendas in the next two years ahead of COP29 at COP30 to ensure affordable, accessible, healthy and sustainable, nutritious food for everyone in this world. And see ambitious NDCs on food, nature and climate and concrete action happening to achieve this. We know we all have a role to play, each and every one of us, and together we can make this happen. Thank you so much. I, I would like now to invite all speakers, panelists and friends, farmers, indigenous peoples, and everyone else to please join us on stage for a family picture. Please join us on stage. Thank you. Oh, great. Brilliant.
Sandrine, you have to come here as well. Are we in? You tell me. Am I live? Yes. So thanks also to all the organizers and the people that put together not only this amazing event, but the people that had made this possible, this big momentum. And I was just in celebrate Rebecca's work that has helped us, all, all of us to be together. Come Sandrine, thanks so much. Brilliant. Well Thank you. Done. <laughs>